out to her car for something. Thanks again for the chicken dinner on Monday night. Oh, it was really, it was awesome. really fun. You. I'm so glad you came. <laughs> yeah, Thank I was glad. So no problem. Which one did you have, Teresa? It's, I, I, I'm tired, and I'm nauseous, and I had a rough morning, at least, not right away, but. Good morning, Living Water Fellowship. I was busy, busy fellowshipping, and I didn't realize what time it was, so I was late getting to the camera here, but that's typical. We are enjoying breakfast burritos this morning in honor of Father's Day. So happy Father's Day to those who are fathers, uncles, cousins, or any kind of um, mentor, you know, uh, men. We're celebrating men today. So eat those burritos. Anyway, we're having fun with that and a lot of fellowship, and we're always, we're always eating at this church. So if you're looking for a place to eat, come on over. That's right, huh, Mary? <laughs> Oh, that's right. That's right. It's all about the fellowship. Okay, um, a few announcements this morning. Men's group is still meeting at 9.30 back in the Sunday school room on Sunday mornings. So join us every Sunday morning, men, um, for a time of devotion and fellowship. Um, ladies group. Um, we've, been do, we've been meeting once a month right now, and so, but we have one more lesson. It's on July 16th. It's a Saturday at 12 p.m., a lunchtime. And um, then after that, in August, we're going to start having weekly, uh, weekly studies, uh, Bible studies with the women. So I'm going to be texting you all, all you ladies, to see if Monday night or Wednesday night's a better night for you, okay? And that way we can go ahead and schedule that, and um, maybe we can do that on a weekly basis there. Um, salsa is still for sale. We have our, uh, down at the bottom here, we have our different sizes there. And one, two, or five dollars for salsa. We have some in the back. Um, so if you're interested in that, uh, you can put it in the box, or you can write, put it in an envelope and write salsa, and we'll know exactly where to put that. Um, over here to my right on the little table there is a, a bucket full of snacks. Um, please take some with you. I mean, there's no way we're going to go through all of that. So we have underneath the, or behind Pastor Jim is our pantry table, and so there's some groceries there. Take some of those too if you can use them. And underneath the table is some boxes and some Walmart bags and things like that. So there's, there's bags to carry them in and bags to put some snacks in and, and take them home with you. Okay, and then after service, if there's still burritos left, feel free to take some with you as well, Okay. Um, so you'll have lunch and dinner, and you won't have to cook. Are women allowed to take them home? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> women can take them home. <laughs> women can take them home. Okay, so <laughs> um, around the corner, we still have some boxes, uh, our can put up for YWCA and Rescue Mission for different clothing items. So if you're cleaning out your closets and, or something and want to donate some clothes or clothing items, shoes, um, right around the corner, we do have an area for that. And then uh, also behind Brother Justin here, we have some boxes on the floor there with care bags. And these are for people who are needy or the homeless. Maybe some of them you see on the side of the uh, road. Uh, we have, and, and there's some down here you can look at too, but they're bags for just have granola bars and crackers and things like that in them. But we also have for their pets. So if you see someone with a little puppy or a dog that might want uh, some dog bones or some dog food. That's what we have. Keep them in your car, and when you roll up alongside the road, you can hand them out. And uh, they, they're very welcomed. I know people love that. And then over to my left, your right, is behind the drum set here is a prayer corner. If you're needing prayer 
or would like to have someone pray with you after service, a leader can meet you over here, and we can sit down and pray with you. So we'd love to do that um, and, and keep that op an option for you. Uh, now, uh, tithes and offerings. If the Lord leads you to give, we have a box in the back underneath the clock here in the sanctuary, or you can give online at www.pwlivingwaterfellowship.com. Again, that's www.pwlivingwaterfellowship.com, okay? And uh, it's pretty easy to get on there and, and give as well. Okay, there's a couple things coming up. Um, first of all, we have our 4th of July uh, barbecue. I think it's July 3rd is the Sunday. So we are going to have a barbecue here at the church um, So for 4th of July. So join us for that. And... Um, and then coming soon, we will have a Tuesday night Bible study. It'll be here at the church at 6.30. Um, I don't know the exact date yet, probably about a month from now. And we'll, let, we'll keep you posted on that. That way, if you have uh, something you want to uh, delve in deeper on a Bible study, we'll have a Tuesday night Bible study. And then um, our Saturday night service, we are going to start that October 1st. October 1st. 6.30 p.m. And so you'll have an option, uh, you know, either the Monday or Wednesday night, ladies. That'll be at 6.30. Um, Thursday night is Desiring Truth. That's at 6.30. And Saturday night service will be at 6.30. That way nobody forgets the time. And so that'll start October 1st. We decided to wait till school was back in and everything's kind of back to normal. Labor Day's over, you know, that kind of thing and we can get, uh, get some people here on a Saturday night. It'll be a um, kind of a scaled back version of Sunday morning, so it's gonna be a little bit of worship and a small message and just a little bit more laid back type of situation. So we would love to have you join us for that. And I think that's all of my list today. Uh, we're, uh, what's that? I can't hear you. Oh, oh, okay. I didn't write it down, but see, that's what happens. Like, does that happen at the grocery store to you too when you go and you don't write it down? And Okay, the most important thing, guys. We have a Sunday school teacher. <laughs> Rachel has agreed to be our Sunday school teacher. I'm so excited about that. We met with her, and she's going to start with um, probably like first through fifth grade. Um, so no junior high and high schoolers yet. We'll, we'll get somebody else to do the youth group later because God's going to send somebody else, right? Okay. But we, we do have someone for the Sunday school, and Kathy is helping out Rachel, and a few of us will be helping her out to get her started and, and get her going. But we're all excited to have Rachel do that with our kids so that we have someone for the, something for the kids now. So praise God. He always sends somebody, right? So that was a praise report. Okay, worship team. I don't know, Carl. We won't let you in, man. It's a story of my life. Carl's. Carl, just stand up. <laughs> That's why we can't Praise God. <laughs> well, if you'd like to, you can stand with us in worship. We got a couple of older songs today. Some we, we like to do some of the old hymns sometimes. One, two. Uh oh, drummer was adjusting. Now we're ready. One, two, three, four. Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord. Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord. Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord. Yeah, 
You ready, church? Sing it. Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord. Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord. Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord. all together this morning. Thank you for the fellowship that we receive. Thank you for the food. Thank you for all the blessings you give us. Thank you for the music and the message that you're, you've prepared for us today. In Jesus' name, amen.
on some of those old hymns because if you really look at the words, boy, they really were loving the Lord when they wrote stuff like that. And and um, Beethoven, you know, kind of wrote that. So that's pretty cool. Here's another old one here. Sing. Come, Come now, count of every breath to my heart. presentation this morning for our kids. Um, I think it's called Fishers of Men. Uh -oh. How fun. And Pastor Ron is not here this morning to do this, so Kathy is going to do this for us. Kathy? Come on up. clicking the grandma. Okay. Here we are. All right. So is it okay if I take Pastor Ron's place today? Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> well, and what is today, the special day today? Father's Day? <laughs> what, did you celebrate it yesterday? Oh, well, <laughs> good for you. <laughs> What was that? Oh. oh. And a cake. Wow, good for you. Good for him. Wow, that was so nice of you. I bet you made your dad very happy. Huh? I know you do. Well, I was thinking that um, since it is Father's Day, that it would be fun to share a story about fishing. Does your dad like to fish? <laughs> Some, how about you? Oh well, we're gonna fish today, huh? Okay, we're gonna fish with those. 
later. How's that? Well, why don't we ask all the men out there to raise their hand, those who like to fish. Whoa, one, two, three, four, five. Wow, well, we have some on board. Six. <laughs> Good for you. You did. Hey, Lizzie, Grandma has to read this. Can you just sit right here? Okay. Well, guess what? Our story is about fish. And I was thinking, that's right. You already know. Good for you. Well, I was wondering, would you hold this for everybody to see the fish? Can you do that? All right, hold it up so they can see. The story that we're going to talk about today is taken from the book of Luke. And this was talking about, huh? You're right. Maybe you should come up and take over. I think that would be good. <laughs> You're pretty sharp. <laughs> All right. <laughs> that would be fine with me. Let's see. <laughs> okay. Well, I was um, in this story, in fact, the Bible has a lot of stories about fish, but this one is particularly about Jesus, where he was walking from town to town, telling them about the love of Jesus, the love of God. And he, and I'll read it to you to start with here. Jesus went from town to town, and he said to the people, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns too, for I was sent for this purpose. So that was the reason that Jesus came to tell us the good news about what? That's exactly right. And that's right. <laughs> good for you, honey. And so he, as he was following, or as he was going from town to town, he, on one occasion, the crowd was so big because they just loved to hear what Jesus was telling them about the kingdom of God. So on one occasion, the crowd was pushing on him so hard to hear the word of God. And so he was standing by the lake of the Sea of Galilee there. And that makes sense, Sea of Galilee. And he saw two boats by the lake. But the fishermen had gone out of them because they were washing their nets. So they got into one, he got, Jesus got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and he asked him to put it out a little bit from the land so the people wouldn't just crowd him too much. So then he sat down, he taught the people from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, you know what? I'm going to let Jesus tell us what Let's take a look and see what Jesus told them from the boat here.
think of that? Hmm? What happened? When they went fishing, what happened? Wow, they got more fish, I think, than they had ever gotten. Do you think they got those all by themselves? Because the night before, they'd gone fishing, and they caught nothing at all. <laughs> well, I don't know that it was that the fish were sleeping, but they were. <laughs> but they caught all the fish, and guess what? They had so much, they couldn't put it all in one boat. They even called their friends, James and John, to also bring their boat. And so when they did, Jesus almost had to tell him, way better stop or we're going to sink here, <laughs> too many fish. So, but you know what happened at that time? What do you think Jesus did? Hmm? He did. He worked a miracle. And Peter noticed that. He knew that they wouldn't normally catch that many fish like that. And that's why he said, he just stopped and told Jesus. He realized that Jesus was really God and he was way more powerful than he was. And so he said, that's why he said, go away from me. I'm a sinner. But, but God, Jesus said, don't be afraid because I'm here to teach you how to fish for men, basically, is what he said. And he wants us to go out and tell people about him and the love of God, just like he does. So I was thinking that, um, do you think that God wants us to fish for men like he told Peter? You do? Well, I wonder if some of the people who are out in the church here today could help us know Give us some ideas on how we might be able to fish for men. What do you think? Why don't you come up here and let's look out at the people. And maybe the, somebody will raise their hand and tell us how we could fish for men. Hmm? How about if you stand down here and look out, and maybe someone will raise their hand and tell us how we should fish for men. Any ideas? Mary. Good for you, Mary. Oh, wonderful. Just, yay, give Mary a hand. That's wonderful. Okay, anyone else? That was great. So basically what Mary was doing was she was telling other people about Jesus and how much, he lo how much God loves them and how much God loves us and forgives us. Like Peter, he knew that he had done some things he shouldn't, but he knew that Jesus was forgiving him. And Jesus said, if we trust him, he'll forgive us too. So that is good news, isn't it? All right. Um, you know what? I think the people here in the church, do you think that they would be willing to sing a song with us? Shall we sing a song? Come on up here and let's see if they'll sing with us. Let's sing this song that some of them might know, but we may have to teach them, okay? Let's stand up and sing it, okay? Oops, sorry. All right, everybody want to stand? In fact, everybody else can stand up too. And let's sing this song about fishing for men, all right? You can watch up here, I guess, or up there, either one. Fishers of men, fishers of men, I will make you fishers of men if you follow me. If you follow me, if you follow me, 
I will make you fishers of men if you follow me. We'll make you fishers of men, fishers of men, fishers of men. I will make you fishers of men if you follow me. If you follow me, if you follow me, I will make you fishers of men if you follow me. Yay! Thank you, kids, for helping us. Like Mary tells people about Jesus, and that's what we can do too. And also, just like Pastor Ron has been telling us, that when we know Jesus, his spirit lives inside us, so we can share the fruit of the spirit with him, with other people. And that, do you remember any of those fruits? Remember love? Joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, self-control. Wow, you guys are good. Very good. Very good. All right. Well, I thought because all the people in the church here were so kind to sing with us and tell us how we might be able to follow Jesus, it'd be nice to give them a gift. What do you think? Would you guys hand these out to all the people who want them? Some may or may not. But let's see what that gift is. Can you tell us, Damari? Follow me and I will make you fishermen. Awesome. Um, it's a scripture to remind us to follow Jesus and to make fishers of men. Would you hand those out, Caleb? <laughs> Here you go, pumpkin. You hand some out, too? Very good. Okay. Lizzie, go hand some. No? Well, go ahead. Okay, whoever would like one to say thank you for helping us this morning. Very good. Okay. Do we need more? Make sure everybody gets one who'd like one. Okay, good job, guys. Good job, guys and girl. And it looks like Lizzie's hanging on to this fish here, so I think, thank you, honey. I think she's eager to go back and fish. So if we've never learned how to fish, we're going to learn today. <laughs> so, I mean for other fish, not real men. Okay, but let's pray first. Why don't we bow our head and let's pray. <laughs> thank you, Damari. You are a wonderful help, and I know that makes Jesus so happy. So, dear Jesus, thank you so much for loving us and for showing us how we can share your love with other people. And we l just want to do that and grow up and learn more about you by following you and making fishers of men. And Jesus, we thank you today for all the fathers who are here today, for them loving us, and for also taking such good care of their families and showing them how to fish for men. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hey, guys, let's go back and go fishing for fish. <laughs> okay. Thank you, buddy. Morning, church. Morning. All right. Okay. 
There we go. That's right. I love it. Um, my wife is going to help me read the word this morning. And uh, we're going to be talking about a good building must have a good foundation. And I'm taking this out of uh, 1 Corinthians 3, 1 to, 1, to, 1 to 23, the verses. Pray with me. Arthur was caught up with me this morning and I have to, I might have to do some, I know, no, I won't do any of that, I'm telling you. <laughs> but anyway, if you'll stand with me, I'm going to read about half of this and then Susan's going to. Okay, it says, and I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ, I fed you with milk. And not with solid food, for until now you were not able to receive it. And even now you are still not able, for you are still carnal. For where they are envy, strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? For when one says, I am of Paul, and another says, I am of Apollos, are you not carnal? Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos but ministers through whom you believed? as the Lord gave to each one. I planted Apollos watered, I love this, but God gave the increase. So when neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, you are God's building. 10, according to the grace of God, which was given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation another and another builds on it. But let each one take heed how he builds on it. For no other foundation can anyone lay that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Can you? I stop right there. Okay, verse 12. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear, for the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire." Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him, for the temple of God is holy, which you are. 18. Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you seems to be wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, he catches the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, that they are futile. Therefore, let no one boast in men, for all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come. All are yours, and you are Christ's and Christ God's. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Father God. We come to you this morning asking you to open up our hearts and minds and receive this message. Show us where we're at in our walk with you, Father. Help us to understand that we need to dig deeper into the word and into you and allow you to come in us, to live inside our hearts. Help us this morning not to stay as babes in the word, but to grow get deeper and to know more about you. Thank you, Father, for what you're going to teach us. Thank you for this message. Thank you for these dear saints that have gathered here today to hear your word. Your word, Father. These things we ask in your mighty name. We say amen. amen. You may be seated, church. A theme that as followers of Christ, we were held in a higher standard of integrity and morality, and 
we live to represent Christ in our churches, our neighborhoods, and in our homes, and in our communities, of course. Always our application, our lifelong drive and desire that the church must remain faithful. I went to a friend's house from school one afternoon to play and hang out. You know, I was excited about going because this was the first time I'd ever been asked to go to his home. We arrived at my friend's house, and he said to me, uh, we have to go in through the back door, uh, Jim, because the front door is really hard to open. Okay. As we walked through the back door, I noticed cracks in the walls and in the ceilings. I noticed the door jams had kind of come apart and different things. It was like the whole house was kind of shifting and leaning to one side. Now, as a 12-year-old, I really didn't understand the physics of how important a good foundation was. But I did understand that leaning like this, it would probably fall down. We played outside and had a great time. I figured there was no point in tempting fate. But you see, church, when we build a house or any kind of building, you must start with a good foundation, see? Without a good, solid foundation, the building will fall down. Sue and I like watching those home renova renovation shows. Anybody else in here? Eh, almost everybody. Mm -hmm. One of our favorites is Love It or List It. It's fascinating to watch David and Hillary, the stars of the show, compete with each other. Hillary will transform, redesign the client's original house with facelifts that make it look like a brand new house. David concentrates on finding them a new home, a different home. It's always interesting to me, church, that Hillary will be renovating these older homes and she will always find surprises. Asbestos, tiles, knob wiring, and there is always considerable number of structural issues. And she has a budget, might be 100,000. All of a sudden she has to rechange the footings and the foundation, now that 100,000 becomes 50. So that's just interesting to us. Sometimes walls have to be completely rebuilt and new foundations and footing posts have to be poured. The bones and the structure of the house must be set first in order for any other fancy work to be done, okay? And any, any way to make the house safe and successful must be done first. Good foundations matter. Bear with me, church. In Matthew's gospel, they came as words from Jesus himself at the end of his Sermon on the Mount. I love that sermon. You should read it. If you have it in a while, pick it up and read it. These chapters have outlined what it means to be a disciple, beginning with a list of blessings called the Beatitudes. They speak of the nuts and bolts of living out our lives in faith in relation to others, particularly to those who are very challenging to us. Jesus reminds us to be strong and faithful. His followers must ground themselves in the words he has spoken, just as a person builds its house on a rock. Now, if you don't follow these instructions, if you don't build your house on something solid, you build it on sand, you're going to be in trouble. Things will shift, and the wind and rain will come and fall down. It's pretty straight forward message about taking the lengthy hillside sermon, not just to the heart, get this church, but into a tangible action as well. Build your house on something solid, a solid foundation. As people of faith, our foundations should be steeped in the promises of God, promises from God. Those outlined by Christ himself and those proclaimed throughout the entirety of the scripture. 
These are the bedrocks of our faith that allow us to build our lives in a way that is shaped by our relationship with God. These foundations are what many of our uh, most loved hymns are made from. It's sad to me that churches won't play the old hymnals anymore. Don't want to hear that. I believe that new things could be incorporated into wash up, but I like the old traditional things too. I like to hear the old hymns. I really do. Hymns like Amazing Grace, How Firm a Foundation, Blessed Assurance. Those songs distilled our faith into the critical aspects worth repeating in that song that commit them to our memories. I remember those songs from when I was a kid. What does your foundation look look like? Let me ask you. Is it built on solid rock? Or is it like Swiss cheese? It's got a bunch of holes in it. Do we as Christians have a foundation that is full of fear and doubt? And you know what's really tough, church? More and more Christians have doubts and fears. Something is badly going wrong when people in the church are fearful about everything. Oh, I don't know what's going to happen. How am I going to make it? God does not give us a spirit of fear. He gives us a spirit of confidence. Not our own confidence. His confidence. Is our foundation crumbling and falling apart, church? Have we tried to fill the cracks with super glue, Velcro, and ready-mix cement to patch it up? Or have we taken the time and gotten down on our knees and asked God to fill us up? Ask God to smooth those rough edges. Ask God to take us where he wants us to go. Or are we just slapping away at it with mortar, Velcro, and like I said, ready-mix concrete. It won't work. I'm telling you, church, it won't work. It will fall. Is our foundation built on the gospel of Jesus Christ and cemented by the power of the Holy Spirit? Think of that about that a minute. The song, How Firm a Foundation, I love that old song. You know, it was published in 1787 by a British pastor named John Rippon. He actually published a whole church hymnal with an extensive collection of hymnals. The song, How Firm a Foundation, was originally known as Exceedingly Great and Precious Promises. You know, the seven original stanzas were based on various biblical promises from Scripture. This is incredible, including Isaiah 41.10, I love that one. Do not fear, for I am with you. Do we fear? Why? I'm human. God says, I know, I made you. But I'm with you. In me, there's no fear. There's no fear. Isaiah 43, 2, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. I'm reminded when I hear that of Peter stepping out of the boat. Can you imagine this? What happened, church? When he had his eyes on who? What happened? He stepped out of that boat and he got to strutting. What happened when he looked away at his circumstances and his surroundings? Ooh, that's lightning over there. Look at the wind. What happened? That's what happened to us. When we take our focus off God, we sink. We fall, and our foundations begin to crumble. I can't tell you enough how much our focus needs to be on God, especially in these times, church. We're looking for everything else to fill up this big, empty hole in our heart that God put there because he knew that we would need him. He knew we would need him. He he knew that we needed to count on him and not what we can do. Really, we can do very little.
Corinthians 12, 9, my grace is sufficient for you. I try to say that one all the time because sometimes I think my grace is sufficient for me. My grace is like silly putty. God's grace is powerful and it is the cement that will glue our foundation together. Sound familiar? I think so. This hymn, if you think about Hebrews 13.5, what's he say? I will never leave you or forsake you. Do we believe that? Do we get in trouble and leave him right away? I've done it. Oh, my gosh, what am I going to do here? And we do everything, and God's standing over there patting his foot, hoping we turn around and come back to him, and he's waiting. But we run around like big me, a big 250-pound chicken with my head cut off trying to figure out what I'm going to do instead of saying, Lord, what are you going to do? What do you have in store for me, Lord? How can you fix this? Because, man, I can't. You know, church, that's what he's waiting to hear. He's waiting to hear those words from us. I can't fix it. I can't do it. Good, let me. Let me. I think, George, I think God gets giddy when we let go. See him get ready to say it. I can't do it, Lord. Good, I can Singing about those foundations of faith provided comfort. You know, those old folks would sing those songs. I used to see my mom and dad with tears streaming down their eyes, singing, blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Wow. Wow. Singing about those foundations, comforting in the face of storms. And that strength to build our foundations on. What does God have to say to us? Are we listening? Two weeks ago, I talked about the natural man and the spiritual man. You see, church, the natural man does not understand the things of the spirit. I don't get it. Neither can he know them, for they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual man understands the things of the spirit, but it's not understood by the natural man. And I'm talking about man or woman, boy or girl here. The world doesn't understand it. They don't get it. What are them them fools talking about over there, living water? We're talking about the power of Jesus Christ transforming our lives into something that he wants us to become. We are talking about surrendering ourselves completely to God. Sometimes I worry about why can't there be more people to hear and come in this church? And God will tell me, you let me worry about that. You just tell them what I tell you to teach and preach. Okay, God. I want to start singing that song. I'm only human. God says, yeah, I know. I know. I'm not. I am God. And I got this. That's what he tells me. Paul now introduces another category of people. Oh, boy. Look out, church. The carnal man. Okay. Pastor Jim, what is carnal? What is a carnal Christian? Being carnal or having a carnal mind is having a mind that is physically, and it, it, it mainly relates to sexual needs, but other activities as well. This, gets, this got me when I was looking through the commentaries and I found this. It said, some have questioned whether there is such a state. Many believe the term is an oxymoron. I'm like, what? They say if you are carnal, you cannot be a true Christian. If you are a Christian, you cannot be carnal. I disagree with this. You know why? Because how many people of faith this day have destroyed their families and their ministries and themselves of living a life of carnality? It's in the paper all the time. You know when a Christian does something, boy, that's, that's first edition news. 
Ooh, look what they did over that church. Those Christians, they're nuts. Oh, look what they're doing. Wow, they're messing up over there. It happens too frequently, church. You know why? You know why that's happening? You guys know why. Because our focus goes away from God and it goes on, oh, my big building. Oh, I have a helicopter to fly. Church, if God gives you those things, okay. But if your focus is on that stuff, then you will fail. Big church, small church, I don't care. You will fail. And I'll tell you something else. God is not interested in all that. He is interested in your heart between you and him. That synergistic relationship between you and him. That's what he cares about. You can't bribe God enough. You don't have enough stuff. And by, by anyways, he gave it to you anyway. My dad told my mom one Sunday, she said, come on, Dad, we need to go to church with the kids. What are you talking about, woman? Who is going to finish that job over there that I'm working on? He had three big jobs going. I think I've shared this with you before. Who's going to finish that? God? Even as a 13-year-old, I kind of went, mm. Is God going to take, go down there and finish these jobs I've got going? Let me tell you something. Monday morning, he dropped with a heart attack. You won't play with God. God can do anything. God wants us to honor him. Always. Sometimes people will say, well, I'm a good person. I do this and I do that. I'm good. You ain't good. I'm not good. I'm a broken sinner. I know that. Hallelujah. But by his grace, I am here. None of us are good. None of us know enough. None of us can be read enough and be prayed up enough. But by God's grace, we are here. That's where it's at. I'm not saying, church, don't get me wrong, we shouldn't be prayed up. We should be read up. There's things we should know, but I'm saying it ain't about you, as an old preacher told me one time. It's not. It's about him. Always. We need to remember that. Remember, you can take your stuff, stuff it in a thimble. That's how about how much God cares about it. Oh, okay. And when you're standing in front of a Where's my thimble? Lord, where's my thimble? You think he's going to remember or care? I'm trying to tell you the focus needs to be every day on him. Carnal. Hmm. Paul calls carnal people babes in Christ. I read this several times. The fact that they are in Christ would classify them as Christians, but they're baby Christians. I've seen people set in a church for 50 years in the same spot, put the same amount of money in, do the same type of activity in churches, not speak to anybody or do anything. Do that 50 years and say, ah, I'm a Christian. You are. But you have not grown in your Christian walk. God wants to see us grow and be different. Don't sit there on your behinds and not be transformed and changed by the power of living God and be something different for him. It's something that bothers me deeply. And I ask God, check me, put me in check every day. Because I don't want to set idle where I'm at thinking about what I'm going to do, Lord. You hear me? Don't do that. You need to grow in Christ. The problem is, we're not growing. 
And after several years, it's a tragedy. You know, there's a natural time to be a baby. I like babies. All the mothers think they're cute. Not so much. I don't think. Oh, mm, alien. No, but seriously. <laughs> oh, the cute little baby. Yeah. Ooh. Okay. I love my kids deeply. Little cute little aliens. Mm. Have a dog biscuit. No, I'll stop. 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 Okay. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> You know, when a person is first born, stop it, Bobby. When a person is first born, and again, when they are a babe in Christ, these are awesome times. You know, when you first come to Christ, how good it feels? And you're walking along, and you're happy, praise the Lord, till you hit that little snag. Something goes wrong. Your girlfriend leaves you. You lost a job. You, maybe you get divorced. A bunch of things happen to you. Pretty soon you're walking around with your dauber down. Man says, where's Christ? Who? Forgot him. I just am hurt right now because I know there is someone who is going through a tremendous amount of difficulty and I feel that they're running away from God. And when we're in the midst of it, we need to be running to God as fast as our little legs can carry us. Boy, I've learned that. I don't think I do it sometimes fast enough. But we need to run to God. Not away from him. Babies are exciting. Most parents cannot, cannot wait to have their own children. I love mine. To see that first smile. To hear that first word, dad, dad. Hmm? <laughs> it's like a beautiful symphony. They say dada first. They don't say mama first. It's dada. No. Dada. Mm -hmm. But think about this, church. If our children grew up and their only communication was mama or dada, and they're 50 or 40 years old or 30 years old, mama, dada, you'd become a little bit worried and even disappointed. My point is this. Unfortunately, there are many Christians, like I said before, have been in the church and they have not progressed beyond the state of spiritual infancy. There are a lot of Christians out there where the non Christian will say, Well, what do you guys believe in? What's your story? I don't know. That's terrible. Well, what does God mean to you? It's like Barry said. He ain't a big guy up there with a beard hanging down. But we do that. We don't even know. Well, well is this story about Jesus Christ? Did he go to the cross? I think so. I'm being silly, but I'm trying to tell you we need to be on fire. And we need to know what we're talking about. And we need to let the world know what we're talking about without fear. Many Christians have been in the church. They have not progressed beyond the state of spiritual infancy. They're bottle-fed Christians. Still in diapers, Paul complained that he fed them with milk for not, they were not able to take meat. They were still unable to digest the meat of the word. Get into the heart of the word. How do we do that, church? How do you think you do that? We read it. We study it. What's the other big P word? Pray, Susan said. We pray. God will give you a discerning heart, and he will give you the wisdom that you need. I like to say many Christians are in a state of arrest, arrested spiritual development. You see a church, you see church, a carnal Christian is one who has received Jesus as their Savior, but denied themselves to take up the cross and follow him. A lot of Christians are like that. I believe. Oh, I believe. Hallelujah. I believe. What do you believe? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. It's sad. 
flesh still rules their lives. They still have little temper tantrums. Jesus might be their savior, but not the Lord of their life. Someone might even ask, are they still Christians? You know, that's not up to me and you. That's up to God. God will answer that question. What does this mean for us? Coming down the home stretch here. Bear with me. I only have 49 pages left. No, I'm just kidding. The marks of a carnal Christian are envy and strife. Did you know that? They're like two Siamese evil twins. They're always coupled together. If you read in the New Testament, one had, was evil, they had strife. If you are envious, you will soon be engaged in strife. I'm telling you, it's a mark of carnality. It's a part of living a life of flesh. You ever know those, those people that nothing seems to please them? Oh, man. I got them in my family. Nothing, no matter what you say, nothing seems to please them. They're not happy about anything. I hate to say what's wrong to them. I try to bypass them. Oh, I hope they don't see me. What's wrong? And you know it's coming. And you wonder, good grief. Aren't you happy about it? You're breathing the same air I am that God gave us. You're not happy about that? You wonder. These people are divisive. They seek to divide the body of Christ. I've seen them in churches before. Try to get a little click. List others to their side. Someone who is always engaging in meaningless arguments. That's a sign of carnality. You know what? There's not so much difference between them saying, and I, I hate this, I'm a Calvinist, I'm an Arminius, or I'm a Baptist, and I'm a Methodist, or I'm a Catholic. Hey, I'm a Presbyterian, or I'm a Nazarene. I need to tell you something. God don't care. He don't care. He doesn't care about all that. God does not care what you call yourself in your life. He cares what you do with your life. You know what? It's interesting that the more spiritual a person becomes, the less denominational they are. Because you know what? Their denomination is Jesus Christ. Ooh, it's Jesus Christ. Wow. And then all of a sudden they have this heart that's huge, and now they can love everybody. Instead of putting down people, we need to be lifting up people. Instead of worrying about what denomination, thank you. Instead of worrying about what denomination this brother belongs to, hey, do you know the denomination of Jesus Christ? Oh, uh, no. That's what you need to be talking to him about. You know, God doesn't care if you're a Catholic. He doesn't care if you're saved. Are you saved? Well, I think so. Well, let me tell you what Jesus did for you. There's a chance to tell your story, church. Let me tell you what Jesus did for me in my life. Quit sweating the small stuff. I sweat the big stuff up here. <laughs> tell your story. The cure for carnality, walk in love. I'm serious, church. Walk in love. Of course, this is a cure for about anything. You know, when I get really upset with Susan, which is truly very rare because she's perfect and I'm not, but um, <laughs> one of the things, Lynn's really laughing at that one, huh? I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to conference, have a conference with Charlie and Lynn. No, it wasn't. But no, one of the things she does is she gets very quiet. I'm like, oh, oh, the quiet stage. And she'll just look at me. And I'll wind down, <whistles> ready to hear her heart. And one of the things that gets me is, she, honey, you know I love you. You cannot fight. If you are fighting when someone says that to you, there's something wrong with you. There's something wrong with you. I love you, she says. I just wanted to share my heart with you. Oh, that breaks me down. That breaks me down. Let's get the iced tea out, and I'm sitting down, and I'm listening. I lost. You're right, Bobby. I'm gone when she does that. And it's not pretense. It's 
I need you to hear me, but I'll love you regardless. That's what she's doing. If you don't, and that's living a Christ-like life. That's what Jesus did. I'll love you through your stupidity. Okay. I love that about her. We might say something like, but they offended me. You ever heard that? That person in church offended me and I'm mad. You know what the problem is, though? We cannot see the concern is only for ourselves. I'm mad because they know I'm mad. I could spit bullets. I'm so mad. My mom used to say that. Gee, mom, spit bullet? Yeah. <laughs> the I, instead of we, is what carnality is all about because it's centered on who, church? Self. Self. You really want to love somebody, then you think about them first and stop thinking about what you're going to get out. You know, when we start to talk to people, that's what we do. We're thinking of the next word we can say. We're like a motor, like an engine. Okay, we're talking to them. All right, they said this. Okay, I got this. I'm going to say this next. And we blurt something out, and they're not even finished to what they're saying. We do that all the time. Guilty. It's wrong. We need to shut up. We need to shut up and listen with our hearts. That's what Jesus did. But no, we got to say the next greatest thing. You know what? We need to get the word into the word of God. But even one better for you, church, we need to get the word of God in us. I'm telling you. Peter wrote, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. True spiritual growth can only come by feeding on the word of God. Peter understood that. We can't grow without it. Oh, but I've read all the great books, and I've done all. I don't care. God doesn't care. He'll say, great. Have you read my book? That's what God's going to say. Have you read my book? Well, I'm getting around to it as soon as I read this. Uh, read my book first, then get around to that one. I'll tell you what you need to know. I'm serious. We do everything but. We feel everything but. And God is standing there going, Jimmy, I'm here. Where are you? Why are you standing way down there? I'm going to tell you something, and I'm closing here. There are those who are always chasing about seeking some exotic spiritual experience. I see that today, and it scares me. Some people will say, you need to speak in... Brother Mark told me this. Someone told him, you need to speak in tongues. Man, I can't even speak in English hardly. What do you mean talking about speaking in tongues? Hey, brother, in <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what you need to do, and that'll say, drink poison and handle snakes. Uh-uh. <laughs> you know what? I'm not going to play with my Heavenly Father's temperament. I'm not going to pick up a handful of snakes and dance around with it. I think, I don't think you should tempt faith like that. Here's the deal. They say, if you do not experience these things, you will not grow in Christ. Wrong. You don't need to grow by a physical experience. You grow in Christ by grace. Grace. If these other things you do and survive them, you better be thanking God. I'm not going to pick up a pit viper and wave it around and have it latch onto my head and kill me. That's just me, folks. The Bible says you can handle these things. I know what it says, but I'm telling you, God is going to see you through anything. He doesn't want you to have to do the extraordinary thing. He wants you to have faith in him. Period. After years, these people who are arrested in spiritual state of infancy, infancy, they're still babes in Christ. The newest exciting speaker comes to town and tells them, you're your own God. 
You don't need God anymore. We watched it, didn't we, Brother Carl? You guys can be your own God. You don't need God. That's old news. Yeah, you stand in front of God and tell him that. You're old news, God. Meet Satan. He may be new news to you, but he's going to burn you. They run around speaking spiritual entertainment, the latest fad, the new improved word of God. People are looking for God, and he's right there. They do not endure sound doctrine, but they have itchy ears. Their flesh must be entertained. They are in their, their, their entire ministries that are designed to attract these people. Do you know that? Let me tell you something about ministry. It is a billion, billion dollar industry. You know that? People make a lot of money doing ministry. They are designed to attract these people. Their ministries are gaudy shows. I've watched them on TV and other places. Paul challenges us to examine ourselves. For he says that we need to judge ourselves. We need to put our own selves in check and find out what we're doing. Are you growing in your spiritual maturity? Or are you still at the same level? The same level when you first knew God. Do you still get offended and feel that you must send nasty little notes to express your displeasure over things that do not please you? Oh, I hate that. Getting a little note. I hate that. You read it and you go, what? What's this? As Christians, we need to go to that brother or sister and say, you offended me. Can we talk about it in love? We can't do that. Be careful, church, about always giving out a piece of your mind. People do that. You may end up with nothing left. You hear what I said? I'm going to give you a piece of my mind. I'm going to get them told. Be careful. We need to walk in love in our churches, our neighborhoods, and community. We need to walk with God, but not just walk with him. We need to become more like him to think like him, to see like him, to hear like him, to love like him. We need to start with a good foundation standing on the solid rock of Jesus. Almighty God, help us today to know that you are that foundation, that solid rock. When we start, we need to step our feet, get our hooks everything we have into you as you lead and guide us. You are our Lord, Lord of Lords. There is nothing, no one greater than you, Father. Help us to understand that. God of gods, King of kings, change us today before we leave this church. In your mighty name we ask these things. We have one more song to share with you if you'd like to stand. Yeah, my
third verse. for this service today. Thank you, Lord, that you remind us that you're in control of everything. Thank you, Lord, to, that you're teaching us daily to become more and more like you, that we grow in our love for you and our study of your word. Lord, we just want to be where you want us to be. We don't want to be babes on milk. We want to grow in the meat of your word and to follow you. Help us to do that, Lord, and help us to share with those around us and be fishers of men. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Dismissed. Have a great week. Yeah.